All right, good morning. Um, you guys ready to get started? Um, my name is David DeBrandt. Um, I'm with Amazon Web Services, and I'm with our business development and capture team. Uh, at the core, I'm spending a lot of time focused on RFPs and preparing for RFPs. Uh, so acquisition is a key part of what I do or focus on. Um, by the way, apologies, I am not channeling my inner Barry White today. I am, I've been on the road for weeks and I think it's caught up with me, so I am going to grind through this. Um, so what we decided to do today is, um, is take a look at three different angles for uh, cloud acquisition. Um, first, we're going to talk about it from a high-level AWS perspective, and I'm going to do about 10 minutes, talk about some of the, the issues and some of the approaches that we've learned over time. And then we're going to take a look at it from a partner perspective. Um, we have our partner ecosystem, which we rely on for, uh, for nearly all the work that we do. They do so much work for us um, in the government, in the public sector marketplace. And then we're going to have um, government come up and talk. So we have David Blankenhorn with DLT. He's the vice president and, uh, of engineering and cloud services. And we have Karen Petraska. She, excuse me, she is with NASA and has done quite a few um, very interesting and unique cloud uh, approaches. Uh, NASA's been a great, great partner with AWS. So with that, I will get started. Okay, so first, uh, I think as we've heard over the last day and a half, um, there are unique characteristics to cloud and, and how cloud operates. Um, utility pricing, um, which is a very big challenge for anybody used to buying traditional IT. Um, contracting, no, min no minimum commitments, no flat rates. It just, it, it is what it is, what you use each month. Um, rapid innovation. The, the, there is, con last year, Teresa Carlson, as she said yesterday, said we had 516 significant features and service upgrades on AWS. That also includes brand new services that we've rolled out. So it is a constantly iterating and changing um, environment. It's an OpEx model versus CapEx, traditional model of CapEx. Um, quickly, go, rapid deployments is also within minutes you can, wrap, you can spin up a server, an instance, and have it and start operating with it. And a very agile architecture. All of this sums up to a very different approach for acquisition. Acquisition is not used to working at this speed um, and with this flexibility. And the acquisition models have not kept up um, uh, across the board. Now, now, this is not just federal government. I've been lucky enough at AWS to work around the world, and we're seeing governments and public sector agencies working through these same issues in the same way. And there are different approaches that have worked or getting close to working, um, but this is, you know, as Andy Jassy, our senior vice president, said, there's a journey into the cloud. There's a journey into procurement as well. That's the way I look at it as we move along. So, Teresa touched on this briefly yesterday. Um, we've seen there's five pillars to cloud adoption, as we've seen it in the public sector. First is just understanding how the cloud works, how it operates, um, and um, how it's different from what it is. And you know, we encourage people over and over and over again, including procurement people. I talk to them all the time, saying, start up an account, try it. There's nothing, I can show you 100 slides, but if you take a look at an account and understand how fast and agile it is, it'll make more sense to you. Um, policy. Um, uh, we are constantly working with governments around the world around policy, and they need to focus on that. Security and compliance. We have multiple sessions on security and compliance and how security and compliance works with AWS. The focus of today or this session is procurement, acquisition. And we, I know when I go in and talk to customers around the world, it is top of my lips to start talking about procurement early and often. And um, if that piece is left out, um, we find that the, the, all the good intentions of cloud, we understand it, our IT folks want it, but if the procurement's not set up the right way, whether it's direct or indirect, um, it can reduce the benefits of the cloud or eliminate the benefits of the cloud. And that's the biggest thing that we see is people set up a traditional IT framework and the, the benefits of the cloud, the agility, are taken away. And we want to avoid that because you, you want to be able to access the full amount. And finally, culture, and that's talked about as well. Um, it's always a challenge. Um, within organizations to change the thinking and the mindset. So with those high-level things, there's a few things to think about that I'm going to hit on here, and then we'll, we'll pass it along. It, first, understand the different models of cloud. Um, 
people seem to blend all these things together. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, even private clouds. They blend it all into one big mix. And we see that with terms and conditions. We'll see SaaS terms and conditions mixed with infrastructure terms and conditions. They are different models and they require different approaches. Um, and you know, one of the examples that we always run into just very simply is uh, to give, give it some context. A SaaS provider, can, you know, they're operating their system on AWS. They will, you, you'll ask them, yes, can you encrypt the data on the SaaS application? Sure, that's fine. I've seen requirements in RFP saying the infrastructure as a service provider must encrypt all data. The way AWS works is we give you the tools and the best practices to encrypt. And that's one of those procurement things, is little line items in a procurement that can really throw things. And so getting involved early and understanding early those issues um, can make procurement operate the right way. Um, another thing to think about, too. Um, traditional world has been you know, system integrator. So this is infrastructure on the left, AWS. On the right is the government uh, customer. In the middle is all the different services that are typically involved in the project. And in the past, or traditionally what it's been is a system integrator will own quite a bit of that. And government will go to system integrator to own from the infrastructure up to their agency. With cloud today, um, this paradigm has changed. Um, the in between, the middle piece that we're looking at right there is governments have the choice. They can do some of that themselves. They can out, out, bring very specialized vendors in for specific things. So it provides quite a bit of flexibility. Um, um, and it's a different way of looking at it. And I think the other thing to throw out there, and I just say this very bluntly, a cloud provider like Amazon is not a system integrator. And I've seen multiple RFPs, again, where people release an RFP thinking that Amazon Web Services provides all the traditional services that they're used to. And they bring them together, and we'll be talking about that as we go forward, mixing the services together. So we're not gonna go through this whole thing. This is the takeaway you have, and by the way, we, uh, you know, we take procurement so seriously that um, it, it's become such a strong issue is we've got white papers uh, on the Amazon website. Um, right now there's a high level one and we also have deep dive ones really to guide um, individual agencies on what to think about. And one of the key things I do when I go in is to bring those white papers and you guys can use them too if you're a partner or if you're a government agency, you can take a look at that as well and go through it. But walking through that and understanding the why of how things operate really does help things. So a couple of things, we, talk, we talked about cloud models, performance-based requirements. When you're looking for infrastructure, you're looking for the performance of the infrastructure. You're not designating what the infrastructure is. I've seen cloud bids that actually say, the server must be an Hitachi server with XYZ in it, and that's what they want it. I've even seen them say, take my equipment and put it in your cloud. Um, so it's learning those pieces up front. Pricing, utility pricing, we've talked about. The other thing is don't try to take, have all the different cloud providers out there provide pricing into the model that you, that you set up, like traditionally how people have done that with infrastructure in the past. Um, people trying to take their approach, whether it's Amazon or somebody else, and putting it into a, a, um, a pricing, oh, different, except the cloud service provider's model. This is really the best way to operate. Um, security, uh, assurance and audit. Um, one of the key things we've talked about is shared responsibility model, and that must be baked into the RFP, and people need to understand where the lines are, and the RFP needs to understand or have that built into it. Um, terms and conditions. Um, you know, ultimately, a cloud provider is a commercial provider of services. And for a cloud provider to start doing unique terms to every single agency, it's again one of those things that reduces or eliminates the benefits of the cloud. It can't do it. With a million active customers around the world, it's something that uh, an Amazon or another cloud provider just cannot adjust to each individual client needs. They have to look at what all the pieces that are brought. Um, finally, is Understanding the ecosystem. Um, people come to us all the time. I've been in discussions with the government, um, international government, where they came to us and um, they were focused on developing contracts for cloud service providers only. And I always ask the question, how are you gonna get this done? Who's gonna do the work for you? You need to bring in the partners that we have, the partner ecosystem needs to be part of the equation um, and understand how they can use that uh, to develop the, 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 uh, the, the solutions that they wanna develop. Um, and finally, well, I'll go to the next one. This is really the key point, or one of the key points, is separating the infrastructure from the services. Blending the two together, same RFP, asking for somebody to do all the pieces, 
um, is taking away the benefits of the cloud. Separate them. It could be different contracts or even different lots on a contract, but make sure they're separated. It's really a key element because um, you're using, you know, we always talk about AWS being a set of Lego pieces. Very complex, different Lego pieces that you put those together. You use those Lego pieces, but you're not gonna, do, you know, the services to do that are done by either you or a partner or um, a consultant that you bring on. Um, so a couple takeaways. So if you're in government, um, or even if you're a company that's talking to government about the cloud, is it's not just the traditional folks you talk to, the CIO um, or the, the business leads. You wanna bring in the whole sort of ecosystem of the government folks. Um, procurement, legal, budget, finance, all these folks need to be at the table. And I will, at the keynote this morning, um, Wade Daly talked about Canada and what they've done with that RFI. We were involved in that. And they, at, at the table, their procurement folks, they had their budget folks, they had their policy folks as they're going through it. So they brought everybody to the table. They're still on their journey right now to understand it, but they've done the right thing, at least in that matter. Um, so what my little quick takeaways, and you can go, is understanding the cloud model and how it's different, how the security model is different, um, working with partners and resellers and how important that is a part of the system. Um, understand pricing and how SLAs work too. We can talk about that in more detail if you have questions. And, um, and ultimately, this is not traditional IT. So, okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to David Blankenhorn. He's gonna sure. give the perspective from uh, a partner. Great, thanks a lot, David. So quick show of hands, uh, how many of you are actually COs, KOs, COTARs, or trying to actually work with your contracting folks to actually acquire cloud? All right, you're in the right place. Okay, um, so I wanna kind of go over some experiences that we've been through. We've been an Amazon partner for almost four years now. We're exclusively focused on public sector, so we kind of understand um, some of the challenges you're going through. Um, so first I wanna point out that, that not all services are created equal. So you have infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, you've got software as a service, you've got Amazon Web Services, so naturally you wanna go acquire this through a services contract, right? That's where the major disconnect first starts. So from a strategic high-level acquisition view, just because it has the word services somewhere in the title, it shouldn't be necessarily acquired as a service, as a consulting kind of thing. At the end of the day, Amazon provides a product. All right? It happens to be available in an on-demand model, but it, it is a product, and it needs to be acquired that way. One of the major uh, kind of snafus that we've run into around these acquisitions is when, as David pointed out, when these acquisitions, these RFPs come out, they actually look like these consulting contracts. So what happens, not surprisingly, is they end up being awarded to large system integrators. Well, there, there's some challenges in that kind of model. Number one is system integrators are phenomenal at consulting. They're phenomenal at actually doing those, putting it together, the integration, the program management. They're really, really lousy at reselling. All right, they're not gonna be interested when you call up and say, I've got a $500 web server a month that I wanna get out on Amazon. I need your product, all right? And I've seen a lot of, of, of deals and opportunities kind of just crash and burn because you couldn't get through the acquisition process because you're going through a consulting process. So again, separating, as Teresa pointed out, separating the product from the actual consulting is really critical in acquiring cloud. The other major plus of separating those out, and as, as Dave pointed out, you know, the SLAs are, regardless of what you see in the press, SLAs for, for large-scale com commercial cloud providers are non-negotiable, right? They're gonna say, this is our availability. It's gonna be three nines or four nines or whatever it might be, this is our availability. Your requirement might actually say you need five nines. Now, I come from the old hardware world. I was a big iron server hugger back in my day, still kind of am to a point. But you look at those hardware providers, right? They all had basically MTBS, mean time between failure on their server products. All right, and you look at it and went, yeah, well, I need five nines, but I look at your MTVF, that's only gonna be about you know, four nines. All right. You couldn't go back to the manufacturer and say, re-engineer this entire server line so it has five nines availability. It has the MTBF to point out where you need it to be. What you would do is you would acquire the product, and then you'd find the consultant to come in and actually cluster the system. All right. Cloud's the same way. You need augmented SLAs, that should be the bolt-on with the consulting, who's actually doing the managed services, who's doing the integration, that's the bolt-on. So number one, again, is really separating the services out uh, and making it easier to acquire. Now that's kind of the macro view. If we take it down one level, you design at the micro level, you purchase at the macro level. 
So what this means is a lot of the questions I run into really are, how do I budget for cloud? How much money do I need to set aside? You know, how much do I need to allocate for this? And what you need to do really is work with DLT, work with other partners, work with Amazon, and look at your workload. All right, let's architect it for you. Let's figure out what your workload's gonna look like on Amazon. What you then do is you extrapolate that over 12 months or your period of performance, and that comes out with your base number, all right? The last thing you wanna do at this point, though, is once you have that design figured out, is go in and procure this at a line item level. I need 8,760 hours of an EC2 M3 small, because if you do that, you're going to completely lose the flexibility that Amazon brings. What we often see when we're actually designing these sorts of solutions for customers is that we'll go and we'll look at the workload and the natural desire is you do the one-to-one. -one. You wanna do a forklift of your current architecture. You wanna replicate it as close as possible to those EC2 instances on Amazon. But once you get it out there, you realize, yeah, that, that four extra large that we had designed for because it was the same size as what we had in-house, we only need a, a large. Or maybe we need two mediums instead of the large. The problem though is if you actually procured it at the line item level, what's gonna now happen is in order for you to actually properly, legally, contractually take advantage of that different architecture, you've gotta do a mod to your order. CEOs hate that. It's a lot of work. And it's always gonna be a catch up because you're gonna implement it and then the bill's gonna come in and it's gonna be different from what was actually on that quote. So it's really key that you actually craft the actual order in the right way so you can still take advantage of the flexibility. Now, as I pointed out earlier, don't treat an acquisition for Amazon like a professional services acquisition. Treat it more like a product acquisition. But there are some analogies you can pull. So the best way to do this from an Amazon acquisition perspective is what you wanna do is you wanna actually look at it from a professional services level effort sort of contract, but for product. What this means is you wanna actually do the level of effort and you wanna trace and treat the Amazon SKUs, the products as your labor categories. So when you actually craft the quote, you wanna have your quantity equal your total contract value. Your line item is gonna be Amazon Web Services $1. And then you have all your LCATs, also known as Amazon SKUs, that you can then pull from. Those are your approved labor categories you can prove from, is the Amazon product. What this allows you to do by doing that whole total contract value and then the $1, is this allows you to actually use anything you want on the menu. And oh, by the way, for those of you in the DOD space, WAF will fully support that kind of model from a payments perspective. And on the on this FedCiv side, IP is gonna be just fine with that. So it actually works out very nicely. It gives you the flexibility, gives you the access to the product. So it works out very clean. Most of the CEOs we've talked to have been very happy with that kind of model. The last thing I want to touch on is there are a bunch of pre-negotiated contracts out there. You don't need to start from scratch. So when you're acquiring or looking to acquire Amazon, GSA Schedule 70, NASA Soup, uh, CIO CS from NITAC. These are all GWACs you can leverage. And by the way, some of these GWACs are also leverageable in state and local space. If you are in the state and local space or higher education, Internet 2 for those of you in the university space. There's a contract out there for that. NCPA. Texas DIR, there's a number of contracts that are out there available, and by the way, many of these actually have pre-negotiated terms that you don't have to go through again. They've already kind of been vetted by those agencies or by those contracting entities. It makes it very easy. So if you're looking to kind of build a BPA kind of structure, that's a good place to start as well. So that's kind of the high level. The other last question I get, and I'm probably gonna get the hook here any second. Okay. The last question I get a lot is, okay, well why don't I just go direct to Amazon? A Couple things. First of all, Amazon is not a contract holder, all right? They don't invest a lot of money in building these huge contract organizations to go and be direct on soups and, and GSAs and others, all right? This is where the partner community comes into play, is that we are contract experts when it comes to these sorts of things. For, you know, major, this is my second major advertisement. For DLT, we've been doing this for 24 years. So we understand the contract uh, venues. All right, so this is one value bring. The other thing is the pricing piece. Uh, pricing is definitely a real challenge and actually more important, not pricing so much as billing. Uh, being able to actually generate clean bills that your actual COs and payment folks can actually understand and actually be able to process is a real key piece. So even those kinds of things, plus the design elements. So with that, I just wanna leave it and I wanna pass this over to Karen. Karen, uh, thank you very much. Okay, 
Okay, so you heard from both sides a lot of good advice about things to do and not do, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we at NASA have done and are working on that seems to be working out fairly effectively for us. Um, I am in the CIO's office. I'm responsible for NASA's development and deployment of our enterprise-managed cloud computing framework. And what we had decided to do after looking at some of the shortcomings of having everyone at NASA buy their own cloud uh, for whatever they wanted to do, we talk, think about data sprawl and lack of security and lack of consistency in IT integration, was that we uh, set about to put a framework in place that would allow us to sort of pay those pioneering costs once to define streamlined IT security compliance and make sure we uh, all were in agreement about the right way to integrate cloud with our IT networks and authentication and authorization and all those other sort of compliance and important things to make this all work properly. And so to the point about separating uh, your, your cloud services from your system integration, that's exactly the approach that we take. And the work that I'm doing provides an agency-wide uh, contract vehicle for people. If anybody can come in and tell us, hey, we'd like to put some money on your contract and do whatever in the cloud, and they can do that, but they need to bring their own programmers or their own system integrators. And we have lots of scientists and engineers um, and IT people, programming teams all over the agency who have uh, the data that they want to work on, they understand how they process their data or do their, uh, op, um, automate their processes. And so often they already even have their own support contractors or system integrators to work with them and their team to do exactly what they all already know how to do. But now they're moving to a new skill set from doing it in traditional data centers to doing it in a cloud environment. And that's actually a pretty good thing as an aside for um, the future of your workforce and workforce development. So um, our, our, uh, in the context of our Amazon services contract, it's Amazon services only. Uh, no integration services, and um, we are using the SOUP contract that was already mentioned, uh, Nas NASA Solutions Enterprise Wide, yes, Solutions for Enterprise pro Wide Procurement. Um, and it, of course, re uh, requires you to put out an SOW to, and resellers bid on it. And as we were figuring out how we wanted to structure our contract, um, Reseller arrangements can uh, have a wide range of terms from a reseller who kind of does almost everything for you uh, and just feeds you what you need, or uh, you can have a high degree of autonomy where your reseller is more of a pass-through and, uh, and you can do most everything yourself. And in our case, we wanted to structure our arrangement uh, more for high, um, high level of agency control because uh, there are things like when you, um, you create, the, when the Amazon account gets created, uh, who, who retains root access to that? And we wanted to have all privileged access be within NASA only. Uh, and so write it in your SOW and some resellers will agree to it and some won't. And we get, you can negotiate in that, um, arrangement there, the level of billing detail that you receive, uh, and, and many other um, things that can tune how much uh, control and management you can have of the relationship and the business and the business processes on your end. Um, uh, intellectual property also, re um, we specified that NASA retains ownership of all the intellectual property in the account. So um, traditional procurement, I would like to buy five blue widgets and 15 green widgets and things like that where you're being very specific about what you want to buy and, and all of our procurement shops understand how to write contracts and statements of work like that. But uh, as was mentioned, you don't know what you're actually gonna want to use or need or what services are gonna be available in the future that might not be available today. You don't wanna be modifying your contract every 38 minutes because now we got Redshift, now we got RDS, now we got something else cool. Um, and so we set this up for non-specific ordering. 
and I'll show you a picture of what that means. But we specified it to include the entire range of services, everything that exists today and everything that might be available in the future. Non-specific. Um, and we, NASA pays published prices for actual services consumed because it's sort of like a rule of thumb that whatever you pay for something in cloud today, tomorrow, it's going to be cheaper, um, at least at this point in its evolution. Uh, reseller passes through all Amazon price reductions to us, and uh, we have provisions for if there's uh, scientific price incentives or other kinds of special things, all of that the reseller is required to pass through to NASA. And here, very important, end of contract administrative transfer of the account and how all those, at the end of the relationship, whether it's a divorce or a happy parting of the ways, uh, what happens to all your data, uh, both within the cloud and your business and administrative data, and how does all that stuff get handled? Um, very good document from the federal um, procurement officers that details a lot of these little things that you have to remember about data rights and other compliance issues. Um, when you get audited by the IG government folks, if you get audited and you will get audited, um, they're gonna come through and look at your contracts for all those nitinoid little compliance details. So remember the, the uh, federal procurement officer's document is a, is a good way to make sure you pass on that audit. But, um, and so we took care of that in our statement of work uh, and our contract. All that stuff comes back to either rolls to the new reseller or comes back to NASA depending on um, what the situation is. So nonspecific ordering. Now, this is from a uh, request for quote, okay? And I think the interesting thing to look at, you can read the words, um, but, but what does that look like? Okay, so we got line item 001, description of services, AWS base delivery order, very generic. Quantity 50,000, unit each, unit price $1. Basically, that puts $50,000 on the account to be spent however, okay? And subsequent modifications simply uh, increase quantities and the total, uh, the total available funds on the, um, on the contract. So, let's see. There we go. From the purchase request, okay, as the contracting officer manages this through the life cycle, um, you can see, we're going to add a line item, we're going to purchase 266,000 units at $1 per unit, and we're going to increase the total contract value of that much. And, I mean, it just looks, so here, you can see traditional procurement thing, but, but you did not see S3 buckets, you didn't see EBS, you didn't see anything like that written on either of those documents, right? It's just generic. And then what happens is um, you go use whatever you use, okay? And at the end of the month, Amazon sends you a bill for all the stuff you used, and it's an itemized bill that tells you how many and who S3 and, and EBS and um, Direct Connect and all those kinds of details that actually uh, that that justify from an audit perspective where that money actually went, what it was used for. Um, and from our customer's perspective, uh, we have a cloud business office that kind of handles this kind of stuff for us. And for the purpose of explaining this to customers or our management, I mean, we think of it as, you know, everybody comes in with a rechargeable Starbucks card, okay, and um, say I have $10,000 and I want to put that on my Amazon account and usually the transfer is in the form of giving us a WBS in, in government terms, but so we charge up their little Star Amazon Starbucks card with $10,000 and uh, there's certainly some monitoring that has to go on to make sure people do not exceed the amount of funds that, that they have available to them. Um, but they use what they use, doing whatever they're going to do, which varies month to month and day to day. Um, 
all the resources they, the individual consumes are tagged to that user, so we can see exactly who used what. Um, and when the monthly bill arrives, we split it out and send each person's portion to them and say, we've decremented your account by this amount. And uh, when the balance gets low, we tell them, hey, you know, you're below our comfort level. You need to put some more money in here. We're going to cut you off. Okay. Um, and today we do all that manually because we have a um, pretty still low level of um, consumption. But that's going to start escalating here pretty rapidly. And we are in the process of evaluating tools to automate the business management and control of all of that happening. Um, but that, that sets everybody up to use anything they need to use Amazon with ease across the entire agency. And um, as I was mentioning, some people have already have a way to get their system integration services uh, to build whatever they're going to build on top of my framework and, and cloud services that we provide. Uh, but if not, we, we help them get access to um, our, some of our Amazon resources or we have co re other uh, integrator contracts that they can use. So lessons learned. Big thing, and we did this, okay? Do a pilot. When, look at the contracts that are available. Pick the one you think is going to work the best. Do as much research as it makes sense to do, and do a small procurement, $10,000, $50,000, something small, and then get some people using it. Try to run through several months of the process of whatever you think your process is going to be, of how people bring their money or don't, how, how you... Uh, how you track the consumption, allocate it to people, get, recover your money if you need to. Um, and it doesn't really take that long to, you know, you could do two, three, four iterations, because there's other things that, it's not just like the money part that you're going to figure out, oh, we could have done that differently. But um, in terms of legalese and other kinds of terms and conditions, uh, things we didn't think of, we didn't really know at the beginning uh, that we were going to feel so strongly about who had root access in terms of resellers or having it or not. Okay? That was one of the modifications that we made in one of our iterations of pilot. Um, and then I already mentioned this, but I'll say it again because it's so worth knowing this. Um, government people use the, the cloud best practices from the, uh, from the federal procurement officers. So um, that's pretty much what I wanted to share. And thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, David. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes left, so wanted to open it up for questions from the floor. So who's got questions? So in the business management, you have a part that counts chargebacks in your thing you're doing at management. <coughs> have you automated that with Amazon so that you can roll those accounts so a sub-program like funds allocated on the Starbucks charge, they would get cut off by Amazon in acquisition and use cycles? In other words, roll that responsibility Um, we work in, at a variety of different levels to deal with um, some of those monitoring and control details. Actually, I actually want to just add one thing to that. So currently there is no functionality within Amazon to set a limit from an account and have an automatic cutoff perspective. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion within Amazon about you know, how or if they could implement that kind of functionality. So right now, um, if you say, okay, I've got it, here's your account, you have a $50,000 limit, we're going to shut you off for $3,000. There's no automated way of doing that. Um, there are ways to set up alarming. Uh, the something that we do is we actually set up all CloudWatch alarms for our bills and notify our customers when they're hitting certain thresholds per month. Um, we're looking into more of a pop watch kind of thing where we can actually look at your overall spend for the account over the course of your period of performance. Uh, but right now there is no like just kill button, automatic kill button for an account. Um, you know, some cases it may be a workload that is 99.9% .9 done, and that program team can actually get the money to cover the additional percent, and they may run this job for six months, and the last thing you want to do is turn it off, lose the results, uh, whereas they may want to run at risk. Um, so right now, there's no automated way, and, and even if you were to, to build that kind of automation yourselves, you need to be very careful about how you might want to implement that. Um, because again, the last thing you want is some HPC environment that you've been six months on and a ton of work, 
and you lose it because it's a minute over or a dollar over. So. Other questions? Jamie's going to take that one. Thank you, thank you, Jamie. Other questions? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, on the state and local side, what we're seeing a lot is, is, is there's a number of state contracts that are actually based off of GSA. Even though they don't, may not like to use GSA, they'll build their own, and Maryland's a good example of that. CMAS does that to a point. Uh, Texas DR still kind of looks at the GSA, but they have their own contracts in place. Um, what we've actually been seeing a lot of states do that aren't going that path, they'll still do kind of a fair and open competition uh, for these sorts of contracts. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll actually put a solicitation saying we're looking for cloud services. If they structure it the correct way, and Dave gets some good pointers on that, um, then you get, get the cloud providers, you get the resellers to respond to that, and then you can sift through and see who's providing the best value for that. Um, a couple of places we've actually done some sorts of contracts like that with customers that did exactly that. Um, ironically, some of them also have done that kind of solicitation, and they've gone back and used another vehicle that was already in place. But then they could say, yeah, we did a fair and open competition, and this other existing vehicle actually works out just fine for us. But we checked the box on fair and open. Uh, so there's that kind of model that takes place. Um, but that's typically what we're seeing is, is where they're not leveraging existing contracts, so they're not able to roll it into, uh, I think uh, there were some struggles around some states about getting it on their existing contracts. Uh, in those kind of scenarios, they're still doing kind of a separate fair and open, separate from their normal state contracts um, to get that in there. And I've seen some states that were struggling with getting it on their more traditional contracts. So we'd be happy to talk you through some of the contracts yep. that we have with partners. We do have a website that does list out our partner contracts, a few direct contracts that we have. And I'd be happy to talk to you about some of the lessons learned. You know, UKG Cloud was talked about this morning. Okay. And very flexible, en enormously flexible contract that they've set up. But it's got its little, it's, it's, it's pieces that can make it difficult as well. So. I mean, there's a lot of contracts. Oh, okay, yep. Okay. Pennsylvania. Well, and, and maybe something that, you know, that's why bringing procurement in early, even, you know, one thing we'd recommend sometimes early too is have legal on legal discussions early. Um, have lawyers talk to each other before a negotiation, just understanding what's going on and having those kind of discussions because it, it, when lawyers are not negotiating, it can be a very, very fruitful discussion. That's what I found. The other thing that I found useful is um, a, lot of, a lot of lawyers will actually have a lot of heartburn over looking over the, the end user license agreement from Amazon. They'll look at the terms of service. Uh, the, the problem they're running into is they're, they're indoctrinated into the software terms of use, they're indoctrinated into hardware and those sorts of things. So what they're doing is they look at this Amazon paper and they go, whoa, this is, no, we can't do any of this. Um, I spent a lot of time with attorneys explaining literally feature by feature and line by line in the EULAs this is why it's structured the way it is. No, you control your data. 
Amazon's not controlling it. You, you can encrypt your data. So explaining them and giving them the kind of the technical context around why it's structured the way it is can be extremely beneficial with legal teams. Yeah, and, and just to play off that, um, one of the things we find, we do all day sessions sometimes with procurement and legal mm -hmm. in a state when people get far and off on the process. Sometimes usually they've tried once and they failed. And then you sit down and you walk through those issues. I and mean, we have a document that it point by point every single issue yep. that we run into. Yep. And the most important part is explaining the why. Why does this happen that way? And when you understand the why um, and how cloud operates to get the full benefits is really the ultimate reason why um, it starts to make more sense. And doing that line by line and taking that time and taking that deep dive um, can speed up the process enormously. So, other up. questions? Yes. So I'm sorry, one more time? Uh, yeah, can you re re please repeat the question? I just want to make sure. Uh, <coughs> so we've seen a task order or a contract procurement. You hear me? You know, it's two different ways. Either for brand name only, AWS. Mm -hmm. Right. Or AWS and Equaline. Yep. And third option being a cloud. I can answer how we did it, okay? Um, our, when we did our procurement, so the way soup works is that um, the reseller contracts are pre-competed and awarded, and then you typically, um, when you sit, submit your uh, statement of work, you're looking for probably three bids or so from different resellers um, in order to choo make a choice. And we specified in our statement of work that it would be uh, AWS or equivalent and if it was if you said it was equivalent to AWS then certain things had to be described about how that was the case what defines AWS is well documented, sure. right, and understood. If you're going to tell me that something is equivalent to that, then you have to explain how it is. And that means uh, if you're right. equivalent, then you give them all the details. Right. Otherwise, it's not necessary. I think this gentleman right here has been waiting for a while. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, the lights are very hard here. So <laughs> who's been waiting a while? Which, you, you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What's the question here? Yeah. <laughs> I'll start with one thing, it's okay. just start early. I mean, that's yeah. what I, it's start early. Um, doing it right before an RFP is about to be released or writing an RFP or having one meeting for a couple of hours and saying, oh, I think I get it. It's starting early, like I said, bring those different people to the table. Um, we have found the most successful are really a, a set of multiple meetings, bringing leadership in, bringing procurement in, bringing legal in, and having a discussion, a half day or a full day discussion. Okay. It's when I can't forecast the burn rate of those units. Right. That's what I what do I tell them? Hey, I don't know how that long this is gonna last. Right. Because I got like I'm in California and like if we start right now, like eighteen months later I'll get a purchase order out. Mm -hmm. So if I don't know burn rate, that feels very risky. Mm -hmm. So what do you what what advice might right. you have? I, I really think that you have to to kind of more socialize what this is and how it works and I, I've, I don't have a good answer for you and it took us 
we're pros at using the soup contract, uh, and it still took us nine months to get through procurement and legal, okay, with those dealing with the very kinds of issues that you're talking about. Um, you know, I, I've tried it by starting with, well, at home you have like iCloud, right? And you know, or, or you have, don't you have Dropbox on your iPhone? Do you know how much of Dropbox you're actually gonna use this month? I mean, right, you're just reaching for some kinds of comparatives that resonate with people. Well, the pilot seems like that might be a good place. That's yes. what I would yeah. highly recommend is, is it's really, it's, it's a crawl, walk, run. I mean, if you try to do a true revolution, we're gonna move our entire data from the cloud, good luck with that. Uh, where we've seen success, though, is a very tactical, very focused workload that you wanna target, because you, you have to learn how the Amazon infrastructure actually works, all right? So if you at least identify, maybe it's an existing on-prem workload that you wanna actually move out there, you characterize what that would look like as a forklift into Amazon. You may put a 20% overage on top of that spend, you extrapolate that over your 12 month period of performance, that's your starting budget for that, mm -hmm. okay? Then you monitor very closely. Uh, you know, if you're at six months and you're completely way off the spend, then you may need to go back and do a change order. But if you're like burning at the right rate, you're good to go. If you're a little below, you got some room to play some more. Um, but again, it, it be very focused, very tactical in terms of finding a workload and, and going forward with that. You're gonna get tremendous learnings from that, which will then ultimately influence all the other, the bigger scale type of stuff. So thank you guys. Um, I've just been given the, the, the next slice. Um, so um, we're up here. If you have any individual questions or wanna follow up, we're happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you all.